Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. This video is going to be an introduction to cranial nerve 10, also called the vagus nerve. Now the vagus nerve is arguably and easily the most complicated of all 12 cranial nerves because its functions are so widespread. Most of the cranial nerves, their functions really just extend maybe down to the neck. Well, the vagus nerve includes the neck and the thorax and the abdomen and a little bit in the pelvic cavity. So fairly complicated. We're going to break it up into several videos. In this one, we're really just going to look at its origin. All right. So I've got this picture up here. This is really just one the skull as it goes towards the frame and magnum part of the spinal cord which is that cervical part of the spinal cord okay also notice over here there's another foramen called the jugular foramen this one its size is a little bit exaggerated there it's actually quite a bit smaller than the foramen magnum but this will come to play in just a minute now what you see right here this is one of the cranial nerves that originates from the medulla oblongata and that is the vagus nerve cranial nerve 10 you can see here its roots coming off of the medulla, and it just loops through the jugular foramen. And once it exits through the jugular foramen, it's pretty much then in the neck region, and there it's going to give off a bunch of branches that we'll see in the next video, and it continues on and on and on down the body. But this is how it originates, and this is how it exits the skull, through the jugular foramen. There's another cranial nerve here that we covered in the previous video, but I want to go over it again because we're going to see that there is a lot of communication between this nerve and the vagus nerve, and that's cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. Again, you can see this one originating from the medulla as well. It's going to originate a little bit further up the medulla, a little more proximally. But again, it's going to come off, loop around, and exit the cranium via that jugular foramen. So there's cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal nerve. Another structure here would be the spinal accessory nerve, or cranial nerve 11. So this is the only cranial nerve that actually originates from the spinal cord. Cranial nerves 1 and 2 are no part of the brainstem or the spinal cord. And then cranial nerves 3 through 12 we often talk about originating from the brainstem, but if we're really being specific, the accessory nerve actually comes from the upper part of the spinal cord, that cervical spinal cord. And that's the reason we usually throw the term spinal in front of accessory nerve to denote that it's not actually coming from the medulla. We also have the internal jugular vein here that's going back towards the superior vena cava. So this is taking blood and cerebrospinal fluid from the cranium and taking it back down towards the heart. And this also exits the cranium via the jugular foramen right here. So there's your internal jugular vein. You can see the same things over here in this picture. This one is the glossopharyngeal nerve originating from the medulla a little bit higher up. Here's the vagus nerve cranial nerve 10 coming over here. And then we see the spinal accessory nerve originating from the cervical spinal cord looping up through the foramen magnum right here and then looping around and exiting uh, through the jugular foramen. What I also want to point out here is something that we'll see in the next video as well. Notice that the spinal accessory nerve right here actually has some communication with the vagus nerve, even though this is typically considered something that innervates the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid, the accessory nerve does have communication with the vagus nerve, but we'll bring that out more in the next video. 
One more picture to look at. So right here, this is our jugular foramen, and you can see a bunch of structures here that exit the cranium. In blue, this is obviously the internal jugular vein. Uh, right here we see, this is the spinal accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11. In the middle, we actually see the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. You'll notice two enlargements right here. Uh, these are both ganglia, and the top one is named the superior ganglion. This one's termed the inferior ganglion, but we'll see that in the next video. And then over here we have cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay. Over here would be the hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12. That one also originates from the medulla oblongata, but notice that it doesn't actually exit the cranium through the jugular foramen. This much smaller hole is called the hypoglossal canal, and that's actually how that exits the cranium. And then over here in red, we have this internal carotid artery. Now, arteries go different directions than veins, right? Vein is draining the brain. This artery is supplying the brain, so it's actually going up, okay, anti-parallel to the internal jugular vein. And this internal carotid artery comes up, and it actually enters the cranium through this hole over here, which is called the carotid canal. So carotid canal, jugular foramen, and the hypoglossal canal. Regardless of which hole they go through, you'll notice that the internal carotid artery and internal jugular vein, most of the vagus nerve in this picture, a little bit of the glossopharyngeal and a little bit of the spinal accessory nerve travel in this structure called the carotid sheath. This is really just a bundle of connective tissue that's designed not only to keep these structures together, but also for protection because they are so vitally important. If you were to have a rupture of this internal carotid artery, uh, that could potentially cause a hemorrhagic stroke of the brain. That would be disastrous. So these are very important structures to preserve. And also the vagus nerve is responsible for a ton of parasympathetic effects throughout the entire body. Some of these structures, however, are going to exit the carotid sheath. They're going to penetrate through it. Notice here the hypoglossal nerve, number 12. It actually is going to penetrate it from the back, go through it, and then come out the front side. The glossopharyngeal is going to exit it by penetrating through the carotid sheath. Uh, and the same thing goes with the spinal accessory nerve. So they're actually going to go through and penetrate through that sheath there in order to get to their respective targets. Before we conclude this video, I want to make sure we understand that the vagus nerve is an extremely important effector of the parasympathetic nervous system, which remember is our autonomic nervous system that is rest and digest, especially once we get to the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavities. That will become much more apparent in terms of things like decreasing heart rate, bronchoconstriction, increasing gastrointestinal motility, and so on and so forth. In the neck, mostly the vagus nerve is going to function in helping to swallow and things like that. Okay, But extremely widespread function, we're going to start exploring that in the videos to come. So to keep an eye out for, we'll have videos over the vagus nerve in the neck and thorax, and then in the abdomen. And then finally, we'll actually look at some of the important nuclei within the medulla where we get a division of labor of the vagus nerve. And there's three important ones that we'll see. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.